Appendix 6, Outline of the Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 1, A, Introduction, 1.1 through 1.27. Both armies have lined up on the battlefield and are prepared to fight. B, Arjuna's Doubts, 128 through 142. Arjuna explains his reasons for wishing not to fight. Chapter 2, A, More Doubts, 2.1 through 2.10. Arjuna gives more reasons for not fighting, but surrenders to Krishna. B. Jnana 2.11-2.30 Krishna's first instructions. Jnana The soul can never die. The body can never be saved. C. Karma Kanda 2.31-2.38 Krishna next explains working in Karma Kanda consciousness. Material gains, heaven or a kingdom, from fighting and material losses, infamy and sin, from not fighting. D. Buddhi Yoga, Nishkama Karma Yoga, 239 through 253. Krishna explains Buddhi Yoga, Nishkama Karma, wherein one works, karma, with knowledge, jnana, and is thus detached from the fruits of his work. E. Samadhi, 254 through 272. By working in Buddhi Yoga, one attains material detachment in the equiposed platform of liberation called Samadhi. Connection between chapters 2 and 3 In the previous chapter, Krishna told Arjuna to keep all abominable activities far distant by Buddhi Yoga. Taking the meaning of Buddhi as intelligence, Krishna's order would mean that Arjuna, by using his intelligence, should avoid all abominable activities and not fight. Yet, thinks Arjuna, Krishna is still urging me to fight. Thus chapter 3 opens with Arjuna requesting Krishna to clarify his apparently contradictory instructions. Chapter 3, Renunciation or Work, 3.1-3.2 through 3, 2. Arjuna inquires whether it is better to be situated in knowledge or to work, as if the two were opposed to one another. B. Nishkama Karma Yoga, 3.3-3.9 through 3, 9. Krishna recommends Nishkama Karma Yoga, work combined with knowledge and detachment. The fruit of that work should be offered for the satisfaction of Vishnu. Nishkama Karma Yoga allows the soul, who is active by nature, to be purified through his detached activities. C. From Karma Kanda to Karma Yoga, 3.10 through 3.16. If one cannot perform detached, dutiful work, it is better to follow the Karma Kanda section of the Vedas. But one should do these Vedic duties, which prescribe sacrifices for Krishna's pleasure. D. Nishkama Karma to set the correct example, 3.17 through 3.35. Dutifully acting without attachment sets the correct example for others who, being less advanced, need the proper example of following prescribed Shastric duties. E. Beware of lust and anger, 3.36 through 3.43. Lust and anger, or passion and ignorance, foil one's performance of duty. Thus one incurs sin. The senses must be regulated and the intelligence strengthened to control lust. Connection between chapters 3 and 4 In chapter 3, we have just heard that lust covers knowledge and that ignorance, lack of knowledge, binds us with attachments. Dutiful, detached work has been recommended to attain transcendental knowledge. Thus, after emphasizing transcendental knowledge, Krishna opens chapter 4 by explaining how transcendental knowledge is received. Chapter 4 A. Transcendental Knowledge About Krishna 4.1-4.10 through 4 .10. Transcendental Knowledge About Krishna Received by Disciplic Succession Reveals the Truth About Krishna's Form, Birth, and Activities. One who knows these truths and thus takes shelter of Krishna becomes purified and attains Krishna. B. Applying Transcendental Knowledge 4.11-4.15 through 4 Although Krishna sanctions the awarding of the fruits of everyone's work, Krishna himself is neutral and awards those fruits according to the living entity's desires and karma. 
One who understands Krishna in this way remains free from material bondage. C. Understanding karma on the platform of jnana, 4.16-4.24 through 424. By applying transcendental knowledge, one can perform detached actions in Krishna's service. These actions are a karma, actions without reactions, and are on the absolute platform. Thus Krishna explains how karma can be seen as jnana. D. Sacrifices lead to transcendental knowledge, 4.25 through 4.33. The fruit of all kinds of Vedic sacrifices is transcendental knowledge, which leads to liberation and ultimately to pure devotional service. E. Conclusion 4.34 through 4.42 Because acting on the transcendental knowledge received through the disciplic succession destroys the sinful reactions to all work, one should do his duty fixed in transcendental knowledge. Connection between chapters 4 and 5 In explaining transcendental knowledge to Arjuna, Krishna has glorified jnana 4.16-18 through 18 and spoken of action and inaction and inaction in action. In text 41, Krishna glorified both jnana and renunciation. But in text 42, Krishna again orders Arjuna to fight. Therefore, chapter 5 opens with a question by Arjuna that is similar to the one he asked at the beginning of chapter 3. Which is better, work or renunciation of work? Krishna will answer Arjuna's question and will explain the process of achieving liberation through karma yoga in greater depth than he did in chapter 3. Chapter 5 A. Nishkama Karma Yoga is easier than renouncing work. 5.1 through 5.6. Arjuna again asks whether renouncing work is superior to working with detachment. Krishna replies that both are equal in the sense that both are means to the same goal. But Krishna emphasizes working with detachment as easier and superior. B. The performance of Nishkama Karma Yoga 5.7 through 5.12. One performing Nishkama Karma Yoga identifies neither with his body nor the activities that his body performs. Through his detached actions, he is freed from the reactions of his activities. C. Knowledge. The Three Doers. 5.13-5.16 through 5 The living being, doer number one, who knows that all bodily activities are automatically carried out by the modes of material nature, doer number two, after those activities are sanctioned by the super-soul, doer number three attains enlightenment through that knowledge. D. Liberation, focusing on the super-soul, 5.17-5.26 One who, in knowledge, devotionally fixes his consciousness on the super-soul and remains materially equiposed, attains liberation in the near future. E. Liberation Ashtanga Yoga Previewed, 5.27-5.28 through 528. One achieves the same liberation through the practice of Ashtanga Yoga. F. Peace on the Platform of Liberation, 5.29 A person in full consciousness of Krishna attains liberation from the pangs of material miseries. Connection between chapters 5 and 6 In chapter 5, Krishna has explained how to achieve liberation through Nishkama Karma Yoga and at the chapter's end, he explained how to achieve that same liberation through Ashtanga Yoga. Now Krishna will describe in greater detail the process of Ashtanga Yoga. Chapter 6 A. Advancing in Yoga through Detached Work 6.1-6.4 through 6 Ashtanga Yogis, like Nishkama Karma Yogis, engage in detached work to advance. B. Yoga Ruda Stage, Giving Up Work 6.5-6.9 through 6 when a yogi's mental control reaches the stage of regarding well-wishers, the envious, the pious, and sinners equally, he may then give up even nishkama karma yoga. C. Further stages in the practice of yoga. 6.10 through 6.32 Krishna describes the practices of ashtanga yoga and its results. Yoga Rudha, 
the perfectional stage, and ultimately the vision of the super soul. D. Necessity of controlling the turbulent mind, 6.33 through 6.36. Although control of the mind is undoubtedly difficult, it is nevertheless essential and obtainable only by constant practice and detachment. E. The destination of the unsuccessful yogi, 6.37 through 6.45. Unsuccessful transcendentalists obtain either heavenly enjoyment followed by an aristocratic birth, if they are slightly advanced, or birth in a family of wise transcendentalists that brings them immediate further training, if they are more advanced. F. The topmost yogi, 6.46 through 6.47. Yogis are greater than empiricists, fruit of workers, and ascetics. And of all yogis, those who with full faith always think of Krishna and render transcendental loving service to him are the highest of all. Connection between chapters 6 and 7. Krishna has explained in chapter 6 that the yogi mo- most intimately united with him is Mud Gatanandhar Atmanaha, thinking of him from within. Mud Gatanantar Atmana, thinking of him from within. Krishna, in chapter 7, begins to explain how to become mud gatinantar atmana. Chapter 7 A. Knowing Krishna by hearing about him, 7.1-7.3 through 7.3. Krishna requests Arjuna to hear of both his material and spiritual energies, and he declares that the transcendentalist who succeeds in truly knowing him is most rare. B. Knowing Krishna's material and spiritual energies, 7.4 through 7.12. Krishna, as the source of both matter and spirit, can be seen in the world when we view all existence as a combination of Krishna's material and spiritual energies. He is also the active essence of everything, and although Krishna is not under his energies, the three modes, all else in material existence, is manifested by combinations of goodness, passion, and ignorance. C. Krishna controls the modes, so surrender, 7.13-7.14. through 7.14. Those who surrender to Krishna, the controller of the modes, will cross beyond the delusion caused by the three modes and come to know Him. D. The impious never surrender, the pious do. 7.15 through 7.19. Four kinds of men never surrender, and four kinds do. Of those who surrender, the jnani who has no material desires is both the best and the rarest. E. Surrender to demigods and impersonalism. 7.20 through 7.25. Those who surrender to the demigods and those who are impersonalists have no knowledge of Krishna, and thus, in their foolishness, Do not surrender to him. F. Bewilderment and freedom by knowing Krishna, 7.26 through 7.30. The living entity's bewilderment is caused by Maya's forcing him to see dualities. His freedom is caused by devotional service, which places him beyond those dualities. Thus, by being conscious of Krishna in devotional service, one can know him even at the time of death. Connection between chapters 7 and 8. Krishna, at the end of chapter 7, mentioned several difficult terms. Arjuna now questions Krishna about what he has just heard. Chapter 8. A. Krishna's answers to Arjuna's questions, 8.1 through 8.4. Arjuna asks Krishna about Krishna's words in the last two verses of chapter 7. Brahman, Adhyatma, Karma, Adibhuta, Adi Daiva, Adi Yagna, and how those in devotional service can know Him at the time of death. Krishna briefly answers as follows 1. Brahman is the indestructible living entity. 2. Adi Yatma is the living entity's nature, which is to serve. 3. Karma is that activity and its reactions that cause the development of a material body. 4. Adi Bhuta is the ever-changing material manifestation. 5. He who presides over all the demigods and their planets is the Adi Daiva, the universal form of the Lord. 6. Krishna, as the super-soul, 
is within everyone's heart and is Adi Yagna, the Lord of all sacrifices. B. Remembering Krishna at the time of death, 8.5 through 8.8. Since one attains whatever one remembers at the time of death, Krishna recommends that Arjuna undeviatingly meditate on him, dedicate his activities to him, and thus attain him. C. Remembering Krishna, 8.9 through 8.13. By meditating on Krishna and his qualities, or by practicing Yoga Mishra Bhakti, one can think of the Supreme Personality of Godhead when quitting the body and reach the spiritual planets. D. Pure devotional service, 8.14 through 8.16. One who undeviatingly remembers Krishna easily attains the Lord's abode, far from this miserable material world, because of constantly engaging in devotional service. E. Comparing the material and spiritual worlds, 8.17 through 8.22. The material world, long-lasting as it seems, is continually being created and destroyed. Beyond this ocean of creation and destruction is Krishna's eternal abode, wherein He is present, and which is attainable only by unalloyed devotion to Him. F. The supremacy of pure devotion in attaining Krishna. 8.23-8.28 through 8 To attain Krishna's abode, Yogis must pass from this world according to mystic formulas. Devotees need only remain fixed in devotion. Connection between chapters 8 and 9 In the 8th chapter, Krishna has explained that the Ananya devotee surpasses the path of light and darkness. Now Krishna will explain how to become such a devotee. Chapter 9 A. Hearing, Qualifications and Disqualifications, 9.1-9.3 through 9.3. The non-envious and faithful will attain Krishna by hearing this most confidential knowledge about him. Faithlessness forces one to take birth and death. B. Aishvarya Jnana, Krishna's relationship to the world, 9.4-9.10. through 9 Krishna pervades, creates, and annihilates the entire cosmos through his material energy. Although Krishna is the supreme director, the material world nevertheless moves independently, and Krishna thus remains neutral and detached. C. Fools neglect bhakti. The divine don't. 9.11 through 9.25 Fools who think Krishna's form is ordinary are defeated in their endeavors. 11 through 12 Mahatmas who know that Krishna possesses a transcendental form take shelter of him and worship him. 13 through 14. Actually, all who take shelter of a conception of the Supreme and worship it are ultimately worshiping Krishna, but they worship him indirectly. These are of three types. 1. Aketvena, the monist, the lowest, the monist, the lowest, worships himself as one with the Supreme. 11 through 12. 2. Vishvato Mukham, a worshiper of the material, universal form is the best. 16 through 19. 3. Prithakvena, a demigod worshiper, is higher than the Eketvena. 20 through 25. D. The glories of devotional service to Krishna. 9.26 through 9.34. One who worships Krishna with devotion or even offers him the fruits of his work becomes freed from reactions and comes to Krishna. The worship is simple and the result super excellent. 26 through 28. Krishna shows favoritism to his devotee. Krishna considers a devotee saintly even if he's committed a horrible act and he quickly rectifies the devotee. 29 through 31. All are purified by devotional service. By thinking of Krishna, offering him obeisances and becoming absorbed in him, one will go back to Godhead, regardless of his position, 32 through 34. Connection between chapters 9 and 10. Especially at the end of chapter 9, Krishna has described devotional service. To help generate further devotion in his devotee, Krishna now explains his opulences.
Chapter 10 A. Understanding Krishna's unknowability, one serves him. 10.1 through 10.7 Krishna describes that his origin is impossible to understand, for he is the source of all. A creation cannot independently understand its own source. One who understands this serves Krishna with devotion. B. The Chatur Shloki Gita 10.8-10.11 10.8 through 10.11. Krishna describes the opulence of his position as the source of all, the eagerness of his devotees to love and serve him, and his own reciprocation with that eagerness. The essence of the Gita is stated in four verses. 1. All of Krishna's opulences are summarized in text 8. By knowing these opulences as the Lord's, one can attain the realizations of texts 9, 10, and 11. 2. Knowing Krishna as the source of all, the devotees cannot maintain their lives without Him. They thus worship Him with the great desire described in text 9. 3. Krishna's reciprocation with such devotees is described in text 10. 4. The devotee's real intelligence, which overcomes the ignorance caked on his heart by millions of births, is awarded by Krishna as described in text 11. The Lord enters his devotee's heart just as a bee enters a lotus flower. C. Arjuna accepts Krishna's position and asks to hear more of his opulences, 10.12 through 10.18. Arjuna refers to previous authorities and confirms that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He then prays to Krishna to know more of his glories so he can always think of him and remember him. Otherwise, as he stated earlier, Krishna will remain unknowable. D. Krishna's Opulences 10.19-10.42 through 10.42. In response to Arjuna's request, Krishna describes the most prominent among his limitless all-pervading opulences. After naming 82 opulences, Krishna summarizes by explaining that these opulences simply indicate his glory, for he pervades and supports the entire universe with a mere fragment of his total potency. Connection between chapters 10 and 11. After hearing Krishna say in chapter 10 that he pervades and supports the entire universe, Arjuna wishes to see that all-pervasive form of the Lord. Chapter 11 A. Arjuna's Request and Krishna's Description of His Universal Form 11.1-11.8 through 11.8. Arjuna, although acknowledging that the two-armed form of Krishna is supreme, requests Krishna to show him the all-pervading universal form of which Krishna spoke in chapter 10. Krishna first describes his universal form and then bestows on Arjuna the vision necessary to see it. B. Sanjaya's description of Arjuna's vision, 11.9 through 11.31. Sanjaya describes that Krishna bestows on Arjuna the necessary vision. Arjuna then beholds Krishna's universal form with astonishment, and he hesitatingly begins to describe what he sees. Arjuna first sees all existence immeasurable with great radiance in one place within this form, 14 through 19. Second, Arjuna sees Krishna's frightening, all destructive Kala Rupa, or form of time. Arjuna asks this form, What is your mission? Who are you? 20 through 31. C. Time I am, become my instrument, 11.32 through 11.34. Krishna answers, Time I am, the destroyer of the world. The great warriors on both sides are already slain by my plan. You can be but an instrument. Arise and fight. D. Arjuna's Prayers, 11.35-11.46 through 11.46. Arjuna, trembling, prays to the universal form. He also begs Krishna's forgiveness for having previously, in ignorance, treated the Lord as his friend. Arjuna then fearfully requests Krishna to again reveal his two-armed form as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. E. Only pure devotees see Krishna's two-armed form, 11.47-11.55. through 11.55. At Arjuna's request, 
Krishna withdraws his universal form, 47 through 48. He then first shows Arjuna his four-armed form, 49 through 50, and finally his two-armed form, 50 through 51. Krishna's most wonderful form, his two-armed form, can be directly seen only through pure, undivided devotional service, 52 through 55. Connection between chapters 11 and 12. After hearing of the Lord's inestimable, impersonal opulences, Arjuna again wants to hear about devotion and to clarify his own position as a devotee who works for Krishna as opposed to a jnani who renounces work. Chapter 12. Bhakti is superior to impersonalism, 12.1 through 12.7. A worshiper of the impersonal is less perfect and undergoes more difficulty than one who worships Krishna with great faith and fixed attention. The path of devotion is recommended not only because it is easier to follow, but also because Krishna himself personally takes charge of delivering his devotee. B. Progressive Stages of Devotion, 12.8 through 12.12, asterisk. Asterisk, verse 12.11 is not included as a progressive stage of devotion because surrendering one's work to a mundane cause does not bring a result in relationship to bhakti. Number one, one lives in Krishna by continually fixing one's mind and intelligence on him. 8. 2. One practices the regulative principles of bhakti yoga to increase one's desire and ability to remember and obtain Krishna. 9. Verse 9. Number 3. One surrenders one's work to Krishna. That's verse 10. Number 4. One cultivates meditation or knowledge. That's verse 12. C. Qualities that endear one to Krishna. 12. 13 through 12.20. Possessing divine qualities makes one dear to Krishna, and anyone who faithfully follows the path of devotional service, making Krishna the supreme goal, is very dear to him. Connection between chapters 12 and 13. Krishna has promised in Bhagavad Gita 12.7 to redeem his devotees. Now, to that end, he will declare the knowledge needed to elevate his devotees from the material world. Chapter 13. A. Arjuna's Six Questions. 13.1. Arjuna asks Krishna to explain six topics. Number one, Prakriti, nature. Two, Purusha, the enjoyer. Three, Kshetra, the field of activities. Four, Kshetra Jna, the knower of the field. Five, Jnana, knowledge and the process of knowing. And six, Nyaya, the object of knowledge. B. Krishna explains the field of activities and the knower of the field. Topics 3, 4, and 5. 13.2 through 13.7. Krishna explains the field of activities as the body, by which the soul engages in his allotted sphere of activities within the material world. Krishna also explains that the soul the knower of the field has knowledge only of his own field of activities. Krishna himself, however, as the super soul, is the knower of all the fields of activity of all living entities. To know the field and its knowers is called knowledge. C. Krishna further explains the process of knowledge and liberation. Topic 5. 13.8 through 13.12. Those activities by which a soul obtains knowledge beyond the limitations 
of his field of activities and thus transcends his field is called the process of knowledge. D. Krishna explains the object of knowledge, topic 6, 13.13 through 13.19. The soul can know the super-soul who is the ultimate object of knowledge. Only devotees can understand the field of activities, the body, the process of knowledge, and both the soul and the super-soul. E. Krishna explains Prakriti, Purusha, and their union, topics 1 and 2, 13.20 through 13.26. 1. Prakriti, Purusha, the Jiva or Kshetra and their union. Material nature causes all material changes and effects, and the living entity meets with good and bad according to the qualities he has acquired due to his association with material nature. 20 through 22. Paramatma, Purusha, Kshetra the super soul exists within all bodies as the overseer, the permitter, and the supreme proprietor. 23. Result One who understands Prakriti, Kshetra, Purusha, Kshetra Na, Jiva Kshetra Na, super soul, and their interactions attains liberation from birth in the material world. Other methods of obtaining liberation are jnana. Ashtanga and Karma, 25-26. F. Jnana Chakshush, the vision of knowledge, 13.27-13.35. Those who see the distinction between the body, its owner, and the super-soul, and who recognize the process of liberation, can attain the supreme goal, 35. Connection between chapters 13 and 14. Krishna in chapter 13 has explained that the living entity is trapped in his field of activities. Krishna will now explain the nature of the trap, how he is controlled by the modes of material nature within that field. In other words, the knowledge explained briefly in Bhagavad Gita 13.22 will now be expanded. Chapter 14 A. The Liberation and Conditioning of Living Entities 14.1-14.4 after glorifying the knowledge that he will now speak, Krishna explains that by him, the Supreme Lord, the material energy is impregnated with the living entities. B. The modes bind the pure soul, 14.5 through 14.9. Krishna then explains that the eternal living entity connects with the material energy through conditioning by the three modes of material nature. The mode of goodness conditions one to happiness, passion to fruitive activities, and ignorance to madness. C. Recognizing a mode's supremacy, 14.10 through 14.13. The modes compete with one another for supremacy in an, in an, in an, in an, ah, in an individual. The modes compete with one another for supremacy in an individual. Knowledge manifests from goodness, from passion manifests attachment, uncontrollable desire, and intense endeavor, and from ignorance comes inactivity and madness. D. Acting and dying within the modes, 14.14 through 14.18. Both the results of one's actions and the results after one's death are predominated by a specific mode of nature and thus bring about certain results. E. Transcending the modes, 14.19 through 14.27. One transcends all three modes by knowing that all in this world takes place under the modes and by understanding that Krishna's activities are transcendental to the modes. Krishna explains that one can transcend the modes by engaging unfailingly in full devotional service. One will then come to the Brahman platform, of which Krishna is the source. Connection between chapters 14 and 15 Krishna described at the end of chapter 14 that one transcends the modes through devotional service, but to attain devotion to him, one needs detachment from the material world. Krishna begins chapter 15 by explaining the need for detachment with a metaphor that compares the material world to an Ashvata, 
a banyan tree. Then Krishna describes Purushottama Yoga in text 6 through 20. Chapter 15. A. Becoming detached from the material world, 15.1 through 15.5. One should detach himself from the material world, which is a reflection of the spiritual world, and one should surrender to Krishna and attain that spiritual world. B. Transmigration, 15.6 through 15.11. One's goal should be to leave the material world and return to the spiritual world. Although all living entities are eternally part and parcel of Krishna, they now struggle from body to body, searching for pleasure. Transcendentalists see this clearly, but blind materialists cannot. C. Krishna's position as our maintainer, 15.12 through 15.15. Knowing Krishna's opulent position as our maintainer on both the cosmic and personal levels, and his position as the compiler of Vedanta and knower of the Vedas, should attract us to him. D. The Tri Shloki Gita of Knowledge A summary of the Vedas and the Vedanta, 15.16-15.18 through 15 1. Conditioned living entities are fallible. Living entities in harmony with the Lord's desire are infallible. 16. 2. Beyond both the fallible and the infallible is the transcendental supreme person, the Supersoul, who maintains the three worlds. 17. Number 3. Krishna is celebrated both in this world and the Vedas as that supreme person, the Supersoul. 18. E. Knowing Krishna means knowing everything. 15.19 through 15.20. Whoever knows Krishna's position knows everything, and he engages himself in Krishna's service. That was incorrect capitalization. Knowing this most Confident, knowing this most confidential part of the Vedic scriptures makes one wise and brings perfection to his endeavors. Connection between chapters 15 and 16. Chapter 15 described the banyan tree of the material world. The modes of material nature nourish both the upper, auspicious, divine branches of the tree and the lower, demoniac branches. In the 16th chapter, Krishna first explains the divine qualities that elevate one on the tree and lead ultimately to liberation. He will explain in detail the demoniac qualities and the mentality which drives one lower on the tree and ultimately to hell. Chapter 16 Transcendental and Demoniac Qualities 16.1 through 16.6 Krishna first mentions 26 divine qualities and then describes 6 demoniac qualities. B. The Demoniac Nature 16.7 through 16.20 To assure Arjuna that he possesses divine, not demoniac qualities, Krishna further describes the activities, mentality, and qualities of one who has demoniac tendencies. Krishna casts these mischief, mischievous demons into repeated births in demoniac, abominable species. C. The choice, escaping to the supreme destination, 16.21 through 16.24. The three gates leading to the soul's degradation and his entanglement in a demoniac mentality are lust, anger, and greed. Every sane man should give these up, act for purification, and attain the supreme destination, 21 through 22. This means that instead of acting controlled by lust, anger, and greed, one should act in accordance with Shastra, 23 through 24. Connection between chapters 16 and 17. In chapter 16, Krishna has established that faithful followers of Shastra are divine and that the faithless are demoniac. But into which category does a man fit who follows with faith something other than Shastra. Is he in goodness, passion, or ignorance? Chapter 17. A. The modes determine one's faith and one's worship. 17.1 through 17.7. Arjuna inquires about the situation of one who worships, but not according to Shastra. Krishna replies that one who doesn't follow Shastra 
worships according to the faith dictated by his acquired modes of material nature. B. Foods in the modes, 17.8 through 17.10. The easiest way to discover a person's situation under the modes is by observing what food he eats. Krishna thus first describes foods in goodness, passion, and ignorance. C. Sacrifices in the modes, 17.11 through 17.13. Sacrifices can also be performed in the modes, dutifully, goodness, fruitively, passion, or unfaithfully, ignorance. D. Austerity in the modes, 17.14 through 17.19. Austerities can be of the body, speech, and mind. Each of these austerities can be performed in goodness, passion, or ignorance. E. Charity in the modes, 17.20 through 17.22. Charity can also be performed in goodness, passion, or ignorance. The results will differ. F. The conclusion, Om Tat Sat, 17.23 through 17.28. All activities are contaminated by the modes, and those defects can be offset by acting, even if within the modes of nature, in Krishna's service, Om Tat Sat. The conclusion is that when sacrifice, penance, and austerity are performed without faith in the Supreme, without a transcendental goal, they are useless both in this life and the next. Connection between chapters 17 and 18. To emphasize the goal of surrender to Krishna, the essence of the previous chapters is taught in the final chapter. Krishna begins his summary of all he has previously spoken by reiterating his prescription that Arjuna renounce the fruits of work, not work itself. Chapter 18 A. Summary of chapters 1 through 6, Karma section, 18.1 through 18.12. A true sannyasi does not renounce his activities but is detached from their fruits. Thus Krishna concludes that the renounced order of life, sannyas, and renunciation of the fruits of action, tyaga, are the same. To perform work in this way is renunciation in the mode of goodness. B. Summary of chapters 13 through 18, jnana section, 18.13 through 18.18. To help us perform activities without becoming bound, Krishna cites Vedanta and analyzes activities as comprised of five factors. The most prominent of these factors is the supersoul. One who acts under the direction of the supersoul is unaffected by reactions to his actions. Summary of the Yoga Ladder C through H Karma. C. The modes control all activities, 18.19 through 18.40. One's work, according to the five factors mentioned above, is dictated by the three modes of material nature. This includes one's knowledge, 19 through 22, one's actions, 23 through 26, one's performance of action, 27 through 28, one's understandings, 29 through 32, one's determination, 33 through 35, and one's happiness, 36 through 39. All activities within the universe are thus controlled by the three modes of material nature. Sikama to Nishkama Karma Yoga D. Freedom from reaction by occupational work, 18.41 through 18.48. Although all work is controlled by the modes, one can nevertheless become free from the reactions of work by acting as a Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaisha, or Shudra, and Nishkama Karma Yoga, while worshipping the Lord through that work. From Nishkama through liberation to devotional service. E. Confidential knowledge. From reaction-free work through Jnana Yoga to the Brahman platform and pure devotional service. 18.49 through 18.55. One practicing Nishkama, Karma Yoga, detached work, attains goodness and the knowledge that he is not his body. He finally attains the Brahman platform. By serving Krishna on this platform with devotion, one reaches the kingdom of God. F. 
working in pure devotional service, 18.56 through 18.60. One on the platform of devotion should work under the order of the Lord, fully depending on Him and being fully conscious of Him. One will thus be free from the control of the modes of material nature. G. More confidential knowledge. Surrender to the Supersoul, 18.61 through 18.63. More confidential knowledge than the knowledge that one is spirit soul is knowledge that one should surrender to the Supersoul. H. The most confidential knowledge of all. Become a pure devotee of Krishna, 18.64 through 18.66. Always think of Krishna. Become Krishna's devotee. Worship Krishna. Offer all homage unto Krishna and thus come to Krishna. Surrender to Krishna. Do not fear sinful reactions. I. Preaching and studying the Bhagavad Gita, 1867 through 1871. For one who explains this knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita to austere, non-envious devotees, pure devotional service is guaranteed. Those who study the Bhagavad Gita worship Krishna with their intelligence, and faithful and non-envious hearers become free from sinful reactions. J. Arjuna is firmly fixed, 18.72 through 18.73. After hearing the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is fixed and determined to act according to Krishna's instructions. K. Sanjaya's predictions, 18.74 through 18.78. Sanjaya ecstatically thinks of the wondrous form of Krishna and predicts victory for Arjuna, the supreme archer, and Krishna, the master of all mystics.